This is a Brunch Pre-Oscars mini podcast to contain spoilers, but we can't imagine you care if you haven't seen the movie and you're afraid of spoilers. There's no way you would logically seek out a movie about the podcast, about the movie with the movie. Let us begin. It is Killers of the Flower Moon. Directed by Martin Scorsese, Killers of the Flower Moon is a Western crime drama based on the nonfiction book of the same name. It has a runtime of three hours and 26 minutes, a 93 on Rotten Tomatoes with an 84 audience score. It has the seventh best betting odds at plus 5,000 and is nominated for 10 Academy Awards, Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actress, Lily Gladstone, Best Supporting Actor, Robert De Niro, Best Costume Design. Yeah, so it's three hours and 26 minutes. We have already reviewed this movie. There's a standalone, I believe, like full-on half-hour review we did on this movie. An extra-long review for an extra-long movie. But, Pete, this movie to me is a lesson that Martin Scorsese can still make a long-ass movie and have it be a good movie, yeah. unlike The Irishman. Yeah, The Irishman I didn't hate, but I haven't gone back to to rewatch it. I don't like miss it. I don't feel like I'm I'm missing a whole lot by not rewatching it. This movie was tremendous, and I think a a more elite p- performance from Martin Scorsese. Like I I thought The Irishman was okay. This was a great movie. Yeah, and I generally rejected the too long stuff. It's weird, like when you go into a, a these days a Scorsese film or a Tarantino film you're almost on like too long protection watch like you you go into it being like what will I say to the masses that will automatically write this off for being too long yeah and in a lot of cases I generally come away from it being like I trust Quentin Tarantino to take four hours of my time than I do to anybody else. And this is, it's long, it's epic. It really takes its time with certain things, but I don't know. Do you want less Lily Gladstone? Do you want less inebriated Leo? Do you want less Robert De Niro? All of whom were amazing in this movie. Do you want less of that Robbie Robertson score? I loved it. So I ge- I generally think that uh, lifetime achievement awards are useless and stupid, but Martin Scorsese and Quentin Tarantino and like elite, elite actors getting to do whatever the fuck they want for however long they want is essentially a lifetime achievement award. And I think it's a deserved one. And like giving somebody that freedom, giving Scorsese the freedom to do whatever he want and to have be audacious as he could possibly dream up, I think is very cool. And in this specific case, he used every minute of that three and a half hours, and I think it was well spent. Did I think it was a bit too long? Sure. But that's like, I'm not going to complain about it. It, it was it was, I, it was, was a weird situation of me feeling like it was too long, but also wanting more of the story. And that's why I came away from it feeling like it was a great movie that I feel like could have been even better as a as a mini series or a limited series. Oh, I remember you saying that at the time. You were yeah. like if they broke this up, that would be incredible. And it would. I don't know if you're getting De Niro and Leo to cross over into that space. I know that A-listers will do it now. Mm-hmm. Man, that would be really good and we'd be saving ourselves the complaints. Although that would be amazing because they would find a way to make it like 9 hours. And each, like, it'd be a mini series where each episode is like two and a half hours. Everyone would be so mad. That would rock. I would love it. And uh, there's a big portion of this, this, uh, this book, Killers of the Flower Moon, that wasn't really translated to the screen, which is the whole FBI part of it. And like, you're two hours into this movie, and the FBI has not, has barely shown up to this point. You haven't even seen Jesse Plemons' lovely face. And, a big, big part of the book is the FBI angle. And I understand why they didn't do it in the movie, because if you spend a lot of time on the formation of the FBI and their involvement in this and sort of that angle, you're kind of making them out to be like the heroes. You are you can see like the white heroes. You don't want to make heroes. this like a white yeah. hero movie. And so like I understand why they kind of tweaked it and went away from that angle and, and minimized it. But I, I, I do think it's probably interesting to see that stuff, and I would be interested to see like get both parts of it given really great care because they do give the Osage part of the story 
great care, which is why I say like the three and a half hour, it felt a bit long, but also it was justified. And those three and a half hours were given a lot of care. Uh, th there are laughs in this movie, or it's generally, f I would say it's funny despite not having laughs. There aren't jokes in this movie. Not really the, the most uh, laughing matter, but there's stupidity. Mm -hmm. There's a little slapstick quality to like, oh man, the John Mulaney thing of like, as long as you still weren't there when the police arrived at the murder, you get away with it every time. The way that they screw it up is comical at points. As I mentioned, inebriated Leo is very important to me. This, I think, is right up there with Wolf of Wall Street. Uh, what are some of his other ones? I, I, I'm sure I talked about it in the uh, full half-hour review, but this was up there for like inebriated, stupid Leo when they bring him in and he's just so messed up. Yeah. Very, very funny. Love that. Uh, the cast in general, I mean, if you have Leo and Lily Gladstone and Robert De Niro, it's going to have great performances, but I loved Scott Shepard as... Uh, as uh, Ernest's brother. I love that we saw our friend Pat Healy oh, in yeah. this. Uh, my biggest issue with the movie, of course, you can't have both uh, Jason Isbell and Sturgill Simpson in a movie. It's too confusing. You get to pick one of those guys, and it's going to be cool when people see him. Jason Isbell, like, sneaky huge role in this movie. Did love that for him, but uh, you're just not allowed to have both those guys. They uh, the, the cameos, they went a little bit overboard at at points in, in this movie. Once it got into cameo, you're right. Like, I, I, th like there, I'm talking about, like, actual, like, roles. Can't do that. But, yeah, like, once you got into, what, like, the Jack Whites? Yes, and the, the Jack Whites. There were a few cameos where I literally gasped in the theater. Brendan Fraser being one of them, just because his entry into this movie was so fucking funny from a visual perspective. Uh, he just like pops up from below the screen and he's just this gigantic of a human being shot from a low angle. Uh, and in, like his first line is just exclaimed. It made me laugh. Uh, and then the Jack, he the Jack White uh, arrival. So fucking funny. And just like. I rolled my eyes like, oh, come on. This is the last four minutes of the movie and you're introducing another ridiculous cameo is one it, for the road. Isn't it at least a step in the right direction, though, from the Irishman? Like I was waiting for Action Bronson. Action Bronson, I thought was like a at that point, I was waiting for the Irishman to like do anything different and like just end <laughs> yeah, and so. die. I don't know. I, I yeah, that's a that's at I, least at that part you're like, okay, we're almost done. Yeah, I've seen the Irishman twice. That's ridiculous. That is ridiculous. That is a horrible use of time. Um, you kind of blazed by it a little bit, but De Niro was awesome in this movie. Great, King. awesome. I didn't know if he still had it in him at this point in his career. He's been doing a lot of like budgety movies some like weird choices for checks i don't know if it's because he's still like having babies at this point in his life he needs to provide that college fund or something but de niro was awesome in this movie uh and they didn't make him fight anybody which was tremendous i'm glad scorsese learned his lesson there yeah i mean this is probably his best performance since the intern which has been a little while <laughs> that's funny he d they didn't have him fight anyone or do uh, like a uh, yoga class outside or whatever that stretching thing was. Mm -hmm. And then Anna Hathaway's character comes in and is like, I need to talk to you. Look, we get it. You're in business and you're always going, going, going. Let the man do his stretching. He was great in this. Uh, I don't think he had. I mean, yeah, he's up for best supporting actor. Not going to happen. No. Robert but, Downey, he's not even the best Robert nominated for Best Supporting Actor. <laughs> this is a strong year for Best Supporting Actor. So uh, nothing to nothing to hold your head in shame about. But uh, Bobby, you ain't winning this one. Uh, or, or that Bobby, you ain't winning this one. Is Lily Gladstone winning this one? Uh, as of this recording, February 25th, per DraftKings, has, uh, uh, is in a tie for the best odds at minus 120 with Emma Stone for a long time. This was considered hers to lose. And now it has reached coin flip status. I'm very coin flippy on this. And I think because of how hard it is to do what Emma Stone did, I do slightly lean Emma Stone. I'm going to uh, invoke uh, another Robert Downey Jr. line, but I'm not going to say it about how you choose characters and how you can play them. Emma Stone proved that wrong or defied that which is 
impossible, but she did it. You so, never go. Right. So for that, I think even this great Lily Gladstone performance is uh, at least... A, 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 at least in position to somehow lose. And she owns this movie. I think it's a 1A and 1B, and I, it warms my heart a little bit because they are such different performances. <laughs> yeah. Like, they could not be more different. Lily Gladstone, very, like, there's a lot of subtlety in this performance. There's a lot of, like, quiet pain that's conveyed and just, like, quiet emotion. And it's it's... A really strong performance. She dominates very quietly. But Emma Stone, on her side, it is the most audacious, ridiculous, challenging performance in a completely different way. And I I don't know. Like, at the end of the day, I look at Emma Stone's performance and I say, if you don't have a strong performance in that role, that movie fucking bombs so hard and is so uncomfortable to watch Lily Gladstone's performance, maybe the movie isn't quite as good or effective if she isn't so strong in the subtle performance of this character, but I don't think it falls off a cliff if you don't have an actress with such a strong performance in that role. Are you upset at all about Leonardo DiCaprio not being nominated for Best Actor? No, not really. I think that he had the third strongest performance in this movie, and like, if you're talking about the big three, it's... I would say it's Lily Gladstone, uh, Robert De Niro, and then like a pretty significant step down, Leonardo DiCaprio. Yeah, I, I don't get, this will probably come into play with Barbie, but I don't get mad anymore when somebody isn't nominated for a category in which they wouldn't be top three. Mm -hmm. And if, so I, Leo is in the group after Killian Murphy and Paul Giamatti and even Bradley Cooper. Where, like, you want to swap in and out Jeffrey Wright and various people. I think Leo's in that group, so I think he could have been nominated, but I'm not upset. It's not like right. he's he wasn't nominated. It's not like he was snubbed from something not that he would have had a serious it. chance of, of winning. Right. But he's great in it, and again... When he's effed up, I love it. Uh, give me some positives from this movie. Positives, uh, they gave great care to a story that should absolutely be known and recognized by the masses. So uh, I didn't have a ton of knowledge about the Osage murders. And obviously, it's a horrific, horrific thing in American history. But it should not be ignored. And I think this story does a really, really great job of telling it and telling it with proper care and delicacy. Yeah, it does. It's, it's the old, like... Wait, this happened? Yeah. How did this happen? How do we how not, are they getting... how do we not learn about this in school coming up? And so like very very important. Uh the cinematography is amazing. All of it is is really interesting and bounce back to Nero. I was very happy to see it. I'll take all of those and I'll add peak inebriated Leo. Negatives, uh murder, wrong. Shout out the life and times of Tim. Uh Robert De Niro's character lies in this movie. I'm glad that you were brave enough to say murder is bad. Yeah, um, murder wrong. I I guess it's a con. Uh, con was hoping for a little bit more of the FBI side of things, and could have been a better miniseries or limited series. Added to the positives, I'll say uh, I liked the uh, I liked Robbie Robertson's score. It is not going to win. Ludwig Göransson owns that nah. ass this year, and <laughs> rightfully so. Letterboxed, I gave it four and a half out of five. I gave it four out of five. This is a change from your initial review. I bumped it down a half star. Um, I think that uh, at the time I said, I'm going to give it f four and a half, but with maybe an option to go down to four, but that would be the lowest that it has. Okay. I think that, that there was talk of room for sugar, meaning that you could go up to five. Yeah. yeah. I've gone, I think I've gone the other way. Maybe it's by. Um, by like relative to the rest of the year's movies. Um, but I, I landed at four out of five here. Yeah. If, I mean, if I had to go one direction from four and a half, it would definitely mm. be closer to four. That is Killers of the Flower Moon. It ain't winning Best Picture, but it's a very good movie.